Be good. All right. So why don't we call the meeting to order? And I've got 2.04 p.m. Or excuse me, 4.02. <laughs> Dyslexic by nature. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, call to order. Item two is approval of minutes uh, from se September 15, 2022. Uh, were there any comments or adjustments to the minutes that were issued? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? A motion to approve. Thank you, Joe. A second? Second. Second. All right, thanks, Don. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, anybody against? No. Okay, so unanimous. Marion, again, thanks for the great minutes. Really, really helpful. Okay, item three, public participation. Public petition. That public participation enables the public to address the commission about an item that is not on the agenda. If you wish to address the commission, please state your name and address for the record. The Arizona Open Meeting Law prohibits the commission from discussing or taking action on an item which is not listed on the prepared agenda. The commission members may, however, respond to criticism made by those addressing the commission, ask staff to review a matter, or ask that, that a matter be placed on a future agenda. Please. Oh, excuse me, public comment should be limited to three minutes regarding time. So do we have anybody that would like to have any public comments, public participation? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, thank you. All right, so then let's move to item four and 4A in specific which is the flood control district discussion. So Lucinda Andriani and Andy Bertelson from Coconino County. And just before we even get going, just want to really say thank you uh, for attending and joining us on this. We look forward to working together in the future on how uh, we can best optimize <laughs> the solutions which seem to be, or which are needed for something that seems to not be ever going away, which are stormwater issues and fire burns and flooding. So please take the floor. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Lucinda Andriani. I serve as the flood control district administrator and also as deputy county manager. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's going to be a bit of a history lesson. Uh, I want to go over the history of the flood control district. Many people aren't aware of that, and that's really kind of critical to understanding what the role and responsibilities um, of the flood control district are and what they aren't. Um, so I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on that up front and then go through and and then specifically talk about uh, some of the the more recent post wildfire events that we've been experiencing both with museum and then of course this last summer was schultz pipeline um, and then uh, part of that history will be talking about the development of the county's uh, forest restoration initiative and then i'll bring it back to that at the end because that's really a, a critical piece that that uh, this commission understand in particular and some of the decisions that have been made even related to this budget year so important to understand that before i start though i also want to um, uh, share that um, uh, our chair of the flood control district board as well as the board of supervisors is with us today patrice horseman um, as well as our county manager steve peru and you all, all we already mentioned andy bertelson deputy county manager as well so uh, with that, I'm going to jump into it here. Let me get this up and running here. And, uh, you know, I, it, it's fine with me. I've got breaks for questions. Uh, but if you have a question, you know, and I guess if we start to trail off too long, then I'll let the chair decide if he wants to, you know, move questions then ultimately to the end. But I'm comfortable either way. So, so as I mentioned, this is kind of the overview here um, in terms of the various topics, uh, a lot of information, but I think it's all critical as we move forward for the commission to have a broader context uh, relative to the district 
and the history and, and the investments that the districts made, particularly related to the city of Flagstaff um, in, over uh, particularly the last three or four years. So some of the fundamentals, um, the County Board of Supervisors serves as the Board of Directors for the Flood Control District. It, however, the district is a legal entity under the state of Arizona and it has its own statutory framework and so forth. So that's important to understand. They are, are not legally synonymous, um, even though the board serves in both roles. This is also true for the Public Health Services District. It's also true for the jail district. So that's not an uncommon framework here in Arizona um, that the board would sit as the district board. Uh, what the, the district was really put into place, and I'll get into this a little bit more of the history, but districts in Arizona, flood control districts in Arizona were put into place really as a result of actions by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which I think you're all well aware, manages the National Flood Insurance Program. And I'm gonna walk through some of that, that but basically the, the district is in place to manage floodplains within unincorporated areas or within jurisdictions that have not chosen to take over the floodplain administration. So cities and towns can elect whether to take over the floodplain administration and work directly with FEMA, or, uh, or it, would, it then lives with the, with the, with the district. Um, and then of course, all the unincorporated. So all special flood hazard areas within the county, the district boundary, county boundary, except of course, not on tribal nations, those are not, not included. Um, they do not fall under the jurisdiction of the, of the district. They're their own sovereign nations, as you know. Um, so that, that is really important to understand that that, that was the framework. And, and prior to 1984 and the establishment of the district, there really wasn't a formal, a real formal relationship between counties and FEMA. This was, this whole legislative effort by the state was to formalize that and, and provide, address an issue that FEMA had in effect. Uh, the, the district is funded through a secondary property tax. It's levied on all private properties uh, within the county. Um, and of course we don't, just like other property tax, we don't collect that from federal land or, or tribal lands. Um, and when that, when the district formation, uh, when the statutes were set up in the early 80s, commensurately, uh, in effect, that the cities also were granted the authority for stormwater fees. They may have actually had the authority prior to that even, Brad may well know more about that than I do, but the concept was that if cities manage their own floodplains, then they had the authority to, to levy a stormwater fee. If counties formed a flood control district, then they would have funding via a, a secondary property tax. So again, as separate jurisdictions. So, and importantly, there, if you look through all the statutory requirements of the flood control district, there is no requirement that a district fund anything within a jurisdiction that's administering its own floodplains. There's actually no requirement for them to fund anything even within any jurisdiction, even if they are managing the floodplain, there's no requirement. So um, that's important to understand as well. Uh, because they gave the authority to the cities to be able to collect a stormwater fee and for them to be able to administer legally directly with FEMA. So, and of course, most cities and towns have chosen to do that. And why do you think that is? It's because stormwater and, and managing flood, you know, FEMA flood hazard areas and other FEMA flood plains is critical to development. So the vast majority of cities and towns in Arizona want to manage their own floodplains because it directly ties to how do you manage development? Because otherwise it would be the district determining where, where development would occur within the city of Flagstaff, for example. So cities that want to manage that decision, most do, most council members want to have that be a decision, right, of the city 
not of an alternate just you know jurisdiction so that's what largely drives that we have a handful that haven't for example sedona did not take over their split by yavapai in coconino county and we both respectively manage the floodplains within sedona the, both districts do yavapai and coconino um, that may change at some point you know they have it it lies with the decision lies with the city or the town it doesn't lie with the district so the district in effect is the last resort if you think about it that way Do cities and towns usually abide by the FEMA, like say a hundred year floodplain, or do they modify that frequently? Um, I really can't answer that. I, you know, I've never really looked at that. I think for the most part, certainly if they have that relationship with FEMA, um, I would say there's a pretty significant amount of pressure to try to manage to that. That said, there are certainly situations and dynamics where attempting to manage to the 100-year floodplain is extraordinarily expensive, witness post-wildfire flooding. So, you know, and, and in other jurisdictions. I mean, I think uh, there, there are some within this area that to manage to the 100-year 100 100 floodplain would be extraordinarily expensive. So, so, you know, it's a dynamic. It's some jurisdictions don't want to collect a stormwater fee politically. The only one that does within within Coconino County is the city of Flagstaff. The other jurisdictions that have floodplain responsibility, whether they do or don't, they don't collect a stormwater fee. I think Sedona did maybe finally put a small fee into place, um, but but historically most have not. The only one that has collected anything has been the city of Flagstaff. <clears throat> So again, it was established that the ability for counties to form flood control districts was established by a state statute. Um, they had, we have to obviously be granted that authority. Um, our district here was formed in 1984. Most of them around the state were formed between, I believe it was 1980 and about 1985. We were one of the latter ones, as I understand. Uh, at that time, Flagstaff, Page, and Fredonia were allowed to opt out of the district at, for the purpose of taxation. And I'm gonna come back to this, but at that time, the county attorney made a decision that because those three jurisdictions managed their, administered their own floodplains, again, had that direct relationship with FEMA, that they could opt out of the district. Um, so property taxes were not collected within those jurisdictions. Uh, at, at, um, up until 2018, and then I'll go through what happened in 2018. The initial tax rate was eight cents, um, and it was basically a small amount just to manage the National Flood Insurance Program within the unincorporated, you know, areas that have special flood hazard areas within them. So. In uh, 2006, the board of directors raised the tax to 20 cents. Um, that was in relationship to a, a project. Uh, Kachina Village made a decision that the, the, the mem residents, their property owners in Kachina Village, made a decision to uh, go to the board of supervisors and request that a road improvement district be formed there and the roads be improved up until the mid, well, 2005, the roads in Kachina Village were all dirt. They were, they were gravel roads. And people elected, there's a district formation process you may be aware of because you go through a similar process with water and, and sewer. Um, they approached, they were, they were granted the opportunity to establish that independent district. The flood control district contributed uh, to that project, an element of that project to manage the flood uh, issues for pump house wash. Um, if you go through Kachina Village, you'll see there's a road crossing there at pump house wash, and it basically funded some of those those uh, flood related uh, elements of that project were funded by the flood control district. That was the first and only project until three years ago when we did a project in Mountain Dell. 
that was ever funded, a traditional flood control. There's only been two traditional flood control projects ever funded by the flood control district. Then in 2010, uh, after the Schultz fire and then you know severe and repetitive flooding that was experienced that summer, um, the flood control district board, again, rate, they doubled the tax to 40 cents. The express purpose of that was actually twofold. One was most obviously we were going to have to have funds to, uh, to match federal funding to implement any kind of flood mitigation in the area, in the Schultz flood area. And so, um, so that was the explicit reason. But there was conversation, if you look back at the record, and I'll credit uh, Supervisor Carl Taylor with this, he also impressed upon the rest of his board members that once we got through uh, the mitigation efforts rel related to Schultz, that there needed to be some level of funding going to the flood control district because we had not done any projects hadn't done studies, hadn't done anything except funded someone in community. Well, at that time it was public works. We funded a, a hydrologist, that was it, who basically looked at development plans. That was pretty much their sole role. So he, made, he advocated, let's get this in place so that in the future, some of the projects that were needed within the county jurisdiction could be potentially pursued. Um, unfortunately, that's never really taken place because of all the post wildfire flooding. So this is kind of the history. I just put this slide in. This is kind of a one one place that captures all of the um, the history of the revenue that was collected has been collected through that secondary property tax. Um, in 2018, and I'll again go through and explain this, but when the boundaries were reaffirmed, which then meant that Flagstaff, Page, and Fredonia were now included in the tax collection for the district. The board cut the rate in basically in half, uh, actually less than half, and uh, so that the actual collection level would remain the same. And as you can see here, um, it was cut to 18 cents. Uh, it was raised uh, a little bit, a couple of cents, about four, a little over four cents in 2020. And that was expressly to begin to fund forest restoration efforts um, and to deal with some repairs that we had had to undertake, taken out in uh, North Schultz flood area where we had a thousand year rainfall event. Interesting enough that we had that, of course, fiscal year 2020 is 2019. And then they raised this tax and then we immediately had the museum fire and then went into, you know, funding a tremendous amount of the effort relative to, to the museum flood uh, issue situation. So, um, so, and then again in 22, raised the tax to be able to fund that gap, to fund the, make the matches and, and fund the response and mitigation, both short and long-term mitigation for museum. So to step back to Schultz flood disaster, I think what we, we used to say, and Steve will remember this, that the flood control district kind of went into Schultz. I mean, we were, I, you know, I, I think of it as being probably infants in the whole flood control dynamic. We were very unsophisticated. We had really virtually no staff and we had one staff person. <laughs> um, we had there, like I said, there'd been no studies. There had really not been much of anything. And then Schultz hit. And um, we had to very quickly uh, develop, uh, you know, a whole understanding of post wildfire flooding hydrology, hydraulic, I mean, it was uh, on steroids. And, and I will say one of the people who was really crucial to that education was John Fuller with Jay Fuller. They were instrumental in that whole effort. They ran all the initial uh, flood hazard modeling and then did the no adverse impact modeling for us through that whole process. Um, Scott Ogden also was with, is with the firm and was very crucial to that entire effort. So. Uh, you know, we learned a tremendous amount in a very short period of time um, uh, and how and what to mobilize to address that, that disaster, which was de declared a presidential disaster, 
frankly, based on the impacts to the water, the city's water line uh, from the inner basin that qualified us. Uh, uh, the, the county only, the district only ended up getting a little over a million dollars, but the city ended up getting, I think, upwards of five, six million to repair that water line. So that was important. And uh, importantly, got a facility on the Mesa, on uh, McMillan Mesa. So uh, this is just recap some of the things. Of course, the you know un the unfortunate highlight is that we lost a 12-year-old girl. We also lost another child to um, uh, to the disaster, not directly from flooding, but from a result of someone trying to address flooding impacts on their property. Um, and obviously, this was there. There was no other focus to the district through this entire period. Uh, we began uh, construction of most of the major mitigation to some uh, some degree in 11. Then with the Natural Resources Conservation Funding in 2013, 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, and that really drained the resources through much of that time frame. There was nothing else that the district was involved in. This is in your packets, this form. It says Schultz flood by the numbers. That's got the accumulation of the projects that were completed during that from 10 through to um, through 15 and includes in, in 2018 uh, repairing uh, the Brandis Way a flood corridor was impacted by that thousand year rainfall event. Then we marched into in 2014. Uh, some may remember that we had a fire in Oak Creek Canyon, the slide fire. And we went immediately into, now we knew what to do. We immediately mobilized modeling, which again, Jay Fuller did, and identified that there was potential for significant flooding, not only affecting the canyon, but downstream through Sedona and South. Um, we secured uh, a, a grant through NRCS exigency, much like the city did to recently develop the, um, the detention basins up at the Y. Uh, and we've spent upwards of, you know, probably at least 900,000 to a million dollars. And I think we see what the economic impact then is that Sedona lost 50% of its tax base that year. Um, and we were very fortunate actually in that we, we never had any really major flood events. We were really, really fortunate. Um, we just dodged a lot of bullets through that whole process. We were very fortunate. And that landscape recovers much more quickly for, as well. Um, uh, you know, to, to fire. Um, so then as we, as we came out of the whole Schultz experience, um, there was again, this it, desire to try to start looking at the floodplains, the special flood hazard areas within the county unincorporated areas. And um, we, we brought on a team of engineers who then did what we called initial engineering assessments uh, for four of the areas. Um, there's a fifth area in Tucson that's also a special flood hazard area. Um, at that time, they did not want to participate. They did not want to be a part of that process. So um, we focused on the other four areas and you can see them listed here. And, and when they were, were completed, um, we also got um, some funding through FEMA to support some of this work. And that that identified two top projects out of those though, out of those studies. One was in Mountain Dell, the Sinclair Wash, which you're familiar with. And then also in Munns Park. Believe it or not, Munns Park gets a hundred year flood. Uh, it's nine feet underwater. It's bad news. It's very very difficult situation. So um, unfortunately, in looking at the Munns Park, we came up with what we thought was a very exciting opportunity to reduce down some of the impacts there. And unfortunately, that did not pass through the no adverse impact. Um, part of what happens in Mun Munns Park is you get both backwater effect and flooding. It be it's a lake. It's a natural lake. Munns Park is a natural lake. And so um, the canyon narrows the backwater. Um, unfortunately, if we if we remove that natural dam, 
uh, it, it unfortunately has negative impacts downstream through Oak Creek Canyon and through, through Sedona. So that was a game stopper. So, uh, but we did identify Mountain Dell that that was a project that we could potentially pursue and we began to budget for that. And that, that project was constructed in 2019, um, right before the museum fire. Um, and again, that's that's the last project, and that's the second of two projects that the Flood Control District has done in its history. Importantly, in 2017, you know, coming out of the Schultz experience, the slide experience, um, the Board of Directors, both the Board of Supervisors and the Board of Directors, really um, began, really understood that if the flood control district didn't begin to invest in forest restoration that we would just repeat this cycle over and over again and we were fortunate working actually with jay fuller again we secured a uh, grant from fema um, they had witnessed what we had been through with schultz and the and frankly the science that we had developed both in terms of mitigation analysis and so forth and they funded uh, funded the district to conduct a study, first it was countywide, and it looked at where are the where are areas vulnerable to post wildfire flooding. And out of that, I think we boiled it down to like there were ten areas. Obviously, there's a lot of areas that are going to flood, and there's nothing downstream, so it doesn't have any impact, right? So we obviously looked at where are the values at risk. And in in doing that, we identified generally ten areas, and then we actually narrowed it down um, to to three areas. One was Spruce Avenue New Wash. The second was uh, Upper Rio Fort Valley, and the third was Bill Williams Mountain. Out of those three, and the reasons we 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 were we had the grant included that we could drill down and do a more defined. Uh, study within two of the two of those areas. Well, at that time, the city had already made it, had gotten the ballot measure on for forest restoration in 2012, and was moving ahead with thinning and work up in the Dry Lakes area, you know, spruce wash. So, we made a decision that had been pretty. That had, there had been some studies. Uh, pr people pretty much understood what the dynamic was there. So instead of investing there, we made a decision to invest in Upper Rio as well as in Bill Williams Mountain, which is the mountain just above the city of Williams. And so uh, those studies were completed in 2017, and that really drove the formation of the count, the district's flood forest restoration initiative. And um, because it, after doing that study with Bill Williams, we worked with the Rural Policy Institute, NAU, and they also did a study looking at what were the impacts, the economic impacts. If we lost, it's projecting, you know, again, in um, a fairly small to moderate storm, there would be a, a, upwards of six feet of water going through Williams. It was really, it's a pretty catastrophic event. And it and it devastates their water system because their water. If you if you're familiar with their water system, it basically eliminates their water system on on, on several angles, uh, not just um, storage but the the system itself. So we had RPI now the Economic Policy Institute uh, conduct the economic study and it showed that there was a regional impact of 369 to 679 million dollar economic impact if we lost Williams to flooding so we made a decision the board directors made the decision that we would begin to invest in steep slope thinning on Bill Williams Mountain and we have been doing that since I think we began the projects in night 18 or 19, I believe in 19, uh, we hired a forest restoration director, Jay Smith, in 2018, and uh, he manages that program overall. Uh, we've had a tremendous amount of success with it, uh, with the Bill Williams Mountain Project. We've had very successful partnership with the Forest Service, with Department of um, forestry and fire management at the state level, as well as the National Forest Foundation, who's actually been managing those projects. Um, and uh, uh, and then we've had some other 
entities that have contributed resources to that as well, but those have been the main partners. We also identified in terms of the steep slopes, um, a very critical area uh, was at, you know, it, this doesn't say Upper Rio, but we still knew by based upon that analysis that the Upper Rio uh, was a very significant issue. Um, it wasn't, I think there's been a lot of, as everyone knows, on and off with four fry and how is that going to affect that area or not. Um, and so we also have been involved in a lot of the discussions, in fact, did an independent study of the Lake Mary watershed and actually identified that the threat there is much less than what had been originally projected. Um, there's still some threat there, but certainly not to the level that had been originally projected. Although the district is contributing to um, a, a Navy REPI grant that has been secured, you may be aware of that, uh, to thin much of the area around the Naval Observatory and some of that other area that would affect the observatory as well as beyond that. Um, so we, we've contributed a couple hundred thousand dollars to that project, and I believe that grant is about it's over a million dollars so um and their the intent i believe is to move forward with that this year the city is a partner in that as well so um so again this has been really in the forefront and been the number one priority for the flood control control district since 17. so and these are kind of the realities of what happens if you don't invest in forest restoration and i think um, just want to emphasize, you know, one of the earlier economic studies that was done uh, and based on um, preparation for the 2012 forest um, Flagstaff uh, Forest Initiative, um, it came in, I think, a billion to a billion and a half. And certainly we know that the valuation within that area now is probably well over two billion. Uh, we're in a process now of expanding that study and and then we'll go back and redo, update the economic impact as well. Um, I'm hopeful to have that done um, within the next six months or so. I think it's really important that we understand uh, what the economic impact is now. I think with, uh, and I'll come back to this, but knowing that the pipeline fire, if it had continued to run west and the winds hadn't shifted and it ran east, you can't even imagine the level of catastrophe we would have had in this city this summer. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a huge wake up call to all of us and the leadership of this community that we have the, a level of disaster that would be unprecedented anywhere in the West. Um, so this just highlights what some of those, those issues are and, and what we know about that um, situation. So, in in uh, 20, I think it was 2017, Andy, was that when you came over to the city was 17? 16. So when when Andy moved over to the to the city public works director, um, I then moved into the public works director position as well as and at that time it was a joint responsibility with also managing and administering the flood control district. And when I took over that position um, and got more, I've been very involved. I managed all the Schultz post flood effort and the mitigation effort, but then getting more involved in ever coming out of that whole effort and more of the day to day business of the of the district. Um, there had been a study done about shifting uh, the administration of the flood control just it had historically been with community development and the community development director and an outside consultant had come in and done a study and they recommended that it be shifted to public works. So the board did that. I became the administrator and I said, okay, so with, with a couple of these jurisdictions, we have this relationship where we're managing their floodplains and Sedona uh, in, in particular. And I said, do we have an IGA? Like where's the IGA with Sedona? Well, there wasn't one. We had no IGAs with anybody. So we had funded some pro little projects over the years and had done some things. Um, and there, there was no formal legal relationship. And so I'm, 
you know, I looking at this, I talked to the county attorney, the county attorney says, oh yeah, this is a problem. <laughs> you know, and particularly if we have funding going forward and if we want to do work with the cities or towns, you know, we're going to have to have some more formal relationship, you know, and obviously, particularly if we're, ma if we're managing their, their floodplains, like in the case of Sedona. So um, the county attorney decided to bring in an expert outside counsel who had a lot of expertise in flood control districts. And she was tasked with kind of going through the whole form, you know, goes just tasked with putting together this IGA. Well, she pulled all the records for the formation of the district back in 84, and she went through everything and came back to the county attorney and said, you have a big problem. You, this district was not formed in, in compliance with the state constitution nor the flood, flood control district statute. And it was, whoa, okay. <laughs> Um, so you've been operating illegally and you're subject to taxpayer lawsuits. Okay. So unfortunately that attorney passed away uh, unexpectedly. She had a massive heart attack in the middle of the night, very sad situation. And another attorney was brought in, Roberta Live say, again, tremendous expertise history with flood control districts. And she went back through, we said, hey, we, you know, you do, she've got all the records and she went back through everything and she came to the same conclusion. And there were a series of meetings, executive session meetings, of course, with the board of directors of the flood control district. But basically coming out of that, the, the board had, um, had to face the, the, the reality that the decision that had been made to allow Flagstaff Page and Fredonia to, to opt out was that was an, an, an illegal decision. <laughs> and we had been not operating within the statutory framework nor within the Constitution. So, so in May of 2018, both the Board of Supervisors and the Board of Directors of the Flood Control District went through and passed resolutions to reaffirm the boundaries so that they were contiguous with the county boundaries, obviously minus the tribal nations. Um, so, uh, and then we marched forward. We had a lot of conversations with, with the city at that time. Obviously there was a lot of concern because now the tax would be applied to private properties within the city. So we met individually with each city, uh, went through, here's the legal, you know, here's the legal decision. We actually told the city of Flagstaff file a lawsuit, go ahead, we'll pay for the legal. We'll pay, we'll pay for, hire your own attorney, you, you know, go file the lawsuit. Because if there was any legal question about this, we, we wanted to have a judge rule on this, right? And we offered to provide, um, to cover that cost. I think the city ended up communicating and Sterling can be the one to, to talk about that, you know, with you, but I think um, it was interesting because the city attorney in Sedona had been the county manager in Yuma and managed the flood control district there. And when we got on the phone, got in the meeting with them, he immediately said, oh yeah, you did it all wrong. We were the only county in the state that had set up the district that way that allowed jurisdictions to opt out. So he said, oh yeah, no. Um, so anyway, I think you know, there were communications with Roberta and other attorneys and ultimately the city decided not to file. We also approached Paige about filing. They elected not to file a case. So it went forward in your packet is this uh, 2018 tax season update. It's got information on the, on the reaffirmation as well as we did a FAQ um, that covers a lot of the the details and so forth as well. So um, I'll refer you to that for, you know, any, most of the questions that you might have are probably answered in that. And uh, so, um, so that was, um, you know, that was a whole twist that no one had ever anticipated and certainly was not the intent of myself nor the, the board of directors going into that. I was just trying to get an IGA in place with Sedona. Um, so, and this is a little bit more information. Again, uh, the board of directors uh, cut the rate basically a little less than half to 
keep keep the collection basically the tax collection at the same level um uh the other thing that the legal counsel strongly advised was that you don't do direct payments to cities and towns. That was an interesting twist as well. But coming out of that whole effort, we had a couple of meetings and I don't remember Brad, if you were at those meetings that we had held a couple of meetings at the um, Museum of Northern Arizona with all the jurisdictions to talk through kind of where's the district going? Why did this happen? And we talked about developing like a com competitive grant program. And at that time, Jim Janicek was kind of working with us on that, or we, we were working with all the city jurisdictions. And at that time he was in a role to be communicating, but we never really reached any kind of consensus about how to move forward with that um, for a number of reasons. Um, one, you know, just how do you, would it, what, how much money do you carve out and then how, you know, how do you then divide up that money? Um, and so, you know, Fredonia gets $3,000 and, you know, it's just, it was, there was a lot of, you know, competing interests there, I'll say, um, between the different jurisdictions. And we never landed on, on anything, although there was good discussion. But through that entire process, the board really emphasized, hey, frankly, irrespective of all this, we're gonna invest our money in post wildfire you know, we're gonna we're gonna invest our money in trying to prevent post wildfire flooding and in forest restoration. That mantra continued through that entire process. Then that summer we had the 2018, we had this major rainfall event, thousand year rainfall event. Fortunately, we had mitigation there uh, post Schultz and it certainly helped, but there was still a lot of damage and that that cost actually is 1.7 million. We went back and updated that. Um, so um, we did though have, uh, had been budgeting over in the last several years prior to 2019 to do this drainage project in Mountain Dell. And we were successful in completing that. Um, importantly that once we get through the LOMAR process, which we're still in, um, we hope that that will remove a set of homes out of the out of the hundred year floodplain and reduce their flood insurance rates. So that kind of goes through the history piece. I know I did that quickly. It's a lot of information, but I'll stop there and um, and then next we'll jump into museum. Any questions that you have at this point? Lucinda, if one quick question, we talked about the rates moving up, down. You know, what is your estimate of what, based on the last county vote, what is going to be coming out of Flagstaff in terms of revenues for the for the flood plain board? Did I say that? So right? with yeah. with the and I'll get into this the recent increase that they approved, you know, in June, um, that tax revenue now is about 9.4. I think it's actually coming in a little less, uh, about 9.2, 9.3 million. And Flagstaff basically contributes half to that, that contribution, yeah. Thank you, Lucinda, it's a great presentation. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I have some concerns about forest management with regard to areas that could impact Flagstaff with regard to flooding. Uh, and that's mainly an interaction between the county and the Forest Service. Are you going to get to that point? Yeah, I'll come so back I'll to forest restoration. Yeah. Until you get there. And I guess I'll, I have to say right up front that it's going to take a partnership of the city, the Forest Service, and the district if we're going to get done what needs to get done to present, you know, prevent that catastrophic event in Flagstaff. So just for Upper Rio. <laughs> so, and then I, certainly everyone is aware, then we went into uh, summer of 2019 um, and uh, having, again, having had these kind of ongoing conversations with the jurisdiction and the whole 
dynamic once again changed with the museum fire. Um, and I think you're aware that that watershed burned very severely. And, um, and we, of course, immediately, my first phone call, just on the record, my first phone call whenever there's a fire is to Joe. That's the first person I call. I don't call anybody else, I call Joe. <laughs> And the good thing is that we had some understanding of the watershed because of the work that had been done with the FEMA grant right earlier. So we had some understanding. Obviously that dynamic now had changed a lot based upon some of the thinning that had been done and obviously a, a bad fire. So this is what you see if you've been up there, very steep slopes, very severely burned, um, uh, a, you know, a lot of, uh, hydrophobic soils. Um, and so we immediately began doing the flood analysis. And, you know, if you noted the date there, we were already in the, should have been already in the monsoon season, July 19th, right? So, I mean, we just mobilized because, you know, as soon as we ran the initial modeling, we saw what the catastrophe could look like uh, th through the east side. And, um, with over 400 homes and 35 businesses impacted. And so we began to implement the short-term mitigation measures. And certainly Andy and I worked together to over, oversee that effort. But, you know, to be honest, and I think Andy would, would have said the same thing if he's still at the city, that the district really mobilized this effort. And if you were out there, you saw it was all county trucks. It was because we knew what to do. We knew what we were facing. We knew what had to be mobilized. And we, we you know, produced over 600,000 sandbags, placed over 6,600 feet of barrier, um, just, you know, mobilized the mitigation effort as quickly as we could. And then, of course, we had a, no, a non-soon, right? And then we had a non-soon the next year. And people kept saying, well, can we take down our mitigation now? Nothing's going to happen. And if you were around me at the time, you knew I was steadfast. No, believe in the science. The science, you know, the, it's good science. And we had adopted that mantra during Schultz and we stuck with it the whole time and it's paid off um, that we've stuck to the science. And then the science proved itself, unfortunately, in 21. And we've had five major rainfall events and six rainfall events overall in the burn scar and had significant flooding through that corridor, even with the level of mitigation that we had implemented. So um, significant damage to infrastructure, of course, um, homes, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then the, the district really took the lead on mobilizing uh, the relationships with the federal government. And we held a meeting in November 21 uh, with the chief of the Forest Service and uh, Congressman O'Halloran and our senators and uh, made the push for both the Forest Service to fund on forest measures, watershed restoration measures, very, the same type of measures we did Schultz that had performed exceptionally well. Um, as well as uh, funding through the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, for uh, measures on private and municipal lands. That includes the, the uh, parkway basins, sediment basins project that um, is slated to get constructed. We have one more piece of that project, which is the parkway basins uh, project uh, up just above, um, just along Paradise, um, within the city limits, that's a city-owned parcel um, that was dedicated during the, uh, in the plat map for that development, actually. Uh, so the, the district is making the match on the NRCS uh, project. Um, th that project may well come in over budget. That's, it's, it's tight, that's gonna be very tight on budget. Um, the on-forest measures, uh, we have completed, now completed that work. Um, the Forest Service came forward with the, the entire amount, um, and uh, we're, we're, it looks like we're going to come in about a million dollars under budget, and they've agreed to transfer that money into uh, on-forest measures for, for pipelines. So that's, that's really a great thing, a good thing. So uh, again, we 
led that effort and secured that funding. And as we saw this last summer, um, it's having a, a very positive impact. People will say, well, we didn't have any really large events. We'll know that the measures that are being constructed on forests, one, they're explicitly to reduce sediment, although they do also reduce the volume of water, they're really explicitly to reduce sediment so that then the city's infrastructure downstream can operate, right? It fills up with sediment, doesn't matter how big a pipe you have, it's not gonna function, or detention facility, or whatever it might be. Um, so um, those, those measures were really critical um, and it's performed as expected or better than we would have expected. Will it perform if there's a 200 year event? It will perform. Will there still be flooding? There will still be flooding. So, um, so here's where we are now where we just completed and then we do have the one more element there, the Parkway Basins project, which will get constructed this spring. This is also within your packet is uh, the museum by the numbers piece, and this shows the projects that the district and shows city's contribution to some of those projects as well. Uh, and you'll see here total cost of the projects is about 12 million, and the districts put in about four to you know four and a half five million into that. Um, we we're very fortunate to get a significant amount of money for the on forest measures from the Forest Service. That was made a huge difference. And then this is the, those numbers kind of repeated again, you'll see here in terms of the investment. So, um, so again, the districts made a tremendous amount of investment in largely mitigating. Certainly we have a, a couple of small areas that are impacted within the county, Mount Eldon is a little section of Mount Eldon Lake, a couple homes in Lockup Meadows but these measures are largely being done to mitigate impacts within the city. So now moving again, kind of staying with the chronology here, moving into the district fiscal year, this fiscal year and now, which of course this, the decision on this budget for this year was made before we had the pipeline fire. We'd had had the tunnel fire, but again, my first call um, run the analysis and didn't see too much of an impact coming out of the tunnel fire. It basically burned the strip along the development, along Timberline, the strip that hadn't burned during Schultz. It really didn't burn much onto the steep slopes. So we didn't see much impact there. We mobilized some effort for short-term mitigation, um, had engineers you know, evaluate meeting with you know, residents, that type of thing, but the, the level of threat was minimal. Um, so, so going into this budget year, just wanted to share some of the accomplishments that had been recognized, particularly want to point to Arizona Forward. Last year, um, we won the uh, President and Governor's Award for our Forest Restoration Initiative. So we're very proud of that. Um, and in the background there, you can see all of us uh, receiving the award. Um, and then there's other things that are highlighted in here of course, the, the museum um, flood area related projects and some other things. And the flood response with the city as well. And that figure includes, um, if you look back, just going back to museum for a minute here, the 1.5 million that we spent up front in 2019, we never got a dime back from, from DEMA. If you don't get reimbursed, from, from Department of Emergency Management unless you actually have a flood event. So anything you do to prepare for flood events doesn't, isn't, doesn't qualify for reimbursement. It only qualifies if you have flooding and then you put in the barrier and sandbags, which is something I'm working on while at the Wild, Wild Land Fire Commission. <laughs> like we're gonna change that. <laughs> Um, because it directly benefits the National Flood Insurance Program if people have mitigation, right? I mean, we've only had a handful of homes get flood on the interior, both in the city and, and out in the county, and it's because of the mitigation, right? Um, a million sandbags and about five miles of barrier does a lot of, has a lot of impact, right? 
So anyway, so back to the budget. Um, the board of directors took a really bold move this this last year. And again, this is pre pipeline. Uh, as you're probably aware, uh, the IIJA, you know, the Infrastructure Act, and thank you to Senator Kelly primarily and Senator Cinema, included significant funding for forest restoration, significant funding to the Forest Service. And in the communications we'd been having, uh, we met with the chief of the Forest Service, communications we'd been having over the last six months to a year was that you know, this area, the Coconino National Forest was gonna get a significant amount of that money and that we could look to that to match money if the district came forward with money. And so the board of directors took a bold move and frankly, over just a bit over doubled the rate, actually maxed the rate, the maximum rate allowed by state statute is 50 cents on 100,000. and. Uh, they max that out so that we would have funding to match those federal funds to get the restoration work done on the upper Rio complete Bill Williams mountain. Although we had already had kind of an agreement with the forest service that they would fund a lot of the remaining work on Bill Williams because we had front ended the earlier work on steep slopes. They were going to, now that they got this funding, they were going to complete a lot of that work. So they set aside around about $30 million to go largely into the upper Rio. That was going to be is 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 the focus. That was the decision. So um, and we wanted to form a partnership kind of similar to what we did with Bill Williams to effectuate that effort. Um, we also now have in, in the partnership the uh, the Nature Conservancy is also working very closely with us. And we just had a major meeting um, with the regional forester uh, last week um, to continue, frankly, to put pressure on the Forest Service to make sure that we do get money toward the steep slopes efforts because it's far more expensive. Um, and some people will say, well, just put fire on the ground. You can't put fire on the ground. We'll lose the whole mountain if you put fire on the ground up there. It's, it's in such a poor condition. There's so much dead and down. And on Bill Williams, we're taking out all the dead and down as well as thinning. We're doing both. So it's and it's proved out we had two lightning strikes up there this last year, this last summer, and uh, they were controlled very, very quickly. So, so again, as I mentioned, $30 million um, and we're, we really need this partnership. We understand that the city, um, it, 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 good for you, you worked very closely with the Forest Service from what we understand coming out of the IIJA and that there has been up to $11 million identified for forest restoration in this area in partnership with the city is what we understand. So um, again, we would really encourage the city, hopefully will join us in this partnership and work with the city, with the forest service to start getting the Rio focused um, on a focus on the Rio, uh, given what we know would be the, uh, the results if it burns and floods. And it will burn at some point. It's not if, it's when. So now moving into Schultz Pipeline, uh, post wildfire flooding disaster, I think most of you are aware. This is a history. I kind of recounted that again. But over the 10, now up 12 years, we've spent well in excess of now of 85 million on post wildfire investments. That's really where the lion's share of all the revenues have gone. Um, the, the actual flooding for its, the flood flows, for example, in the Schultz Creek flood corridor, which flows into 180, it's 26 times the level that it was pre-fire. So some of the other quarters, government tank, we're looking at 22 times significant increase in the threat of flooding. And here's, I'm going to just share with you a couple of videos here. Um, this is the Copeland uh, flood corridor. This was, this is out on the east side, Timberline area. Um, this corridor was impacted by Schultz, the Schultz fire. And as it was the one to the north, Peaceful, it's called Peaceful Way, ironically. Uh, and um, 
but both of these corridors, the com those community members decided not to move forward with mitigation after Schultz. So we mitigated five flood corridors, two elected not to go forward, and electing meant that they didn't provide drainage easements for the channels. Because um, we, we, build, we build these integrated systems of on-force watershed restoration that then brings the water into a channel system that goes through the neighborhoods and um, they, they have to go hand in hand. If anything, we learned that we have to have an integrated system. It has to work that way. And now, and it has to be able to cross the highway or there has to be detention to manage crossing the highway um, that takes that integrated you know, process. So, so this is a watershed. Oh, let's see, you know what I didn't do? Let me stop this for a minute. Um, uh, let's see. How do we get the volume up? Do you know, Marion? Because it's really great to hear this. It's pretty amazing. Let's see if I go. Uh, it's showing it's on here. Let's see if I go. It's funny because that says, there we go. All right, let's try it again. Sorry. Okay, let's. There we go. Okay. So when people out there, and they'll said this during Schultz, it sounds like a train is coming. That's what it sounds like. And this is what a watershed looks like when it unravels. It, these are boulders are upwards of eight feet in dyna diameter. You can see trees, stumps coming down. Um, and this is not even the model. The, the storm that was modeled uh, was a two inch and 45 minute rainfall event that was based on looking at the historical gauges in the Schultz flood area. And uh, I think this event was maybe a five year, five to maybe max 10. The largest event we've had out there is, well, anywhere, either here or out there has been a 10 year event. So we have not seen that the 20, the two inch and 45 minutes is a 25 year event. So, so this is um, that area where you saw the boulders coming down. This is what it looked like when the water recedes. And that video was taken from that Victoria on the left there from their porch, which fortunately did not get destroyed. Um, uh, so you can see just the mount and these boulders extend down about another probably half mile to three quarters of a mile further on um, through the, the watershed. And this is just downstream, just, just east of that um, home and property is a roadway, a county roadway. And then this is the erosion. So you, you see it spread out there, it was able to spread out but here it's channelizing and we're seeing, this is the type of head cuts we're seeing out there now. Some, this was actually early in the year, um, early in the season, the head cuts now in some of this area are 15 to 20 feet deep. This is Wupaki Trails. This is a home that's been impacted at the Southern end. Many homes have been heavily impacted there. Um, the first flood event that occurred there in June, um, uh, they got two to three feet of water in that home and they've been out of the home since then. Um, he's hoping to get back in there this fall, uh, but it's, uh, and Wupaki Trails is a quarter that we mitigated post Schultz. To give you an understanding, we mitigated to the, uh, to about 140, it was a five year post wildfire design storm which was approximately 140 cubic feet per second. The volume of water on the, the bigger events has been estimated at 1,000 to 1,500, and the two inch storm is at 2,000 CFS. So gives you an understanding of what the increase in the volume, and the reason for that is that this watershed, the watershed furthest 
to the north. There's actually one further to the north than this that burned as well, but one that affects homes. This is the furthest north, Lenox. Um, to, it really burns severely on the upper slopes. And um, those upper slopes are just, they're gone. Again, this watershed is, is completely unraveled. And that's what you're seeing here. So, and that's also happened in the government tank watershed um, as well. And this is that home and what it looks like once the water recedes and even with the barrier, it's still just getting pummeled. So we're, and this is Seacrest School and this is that 180, of course. You can see the water coming in here and um, some of the flooding there. And then this is post flooding, you can see the debris. And then the pooling that happens in the Sistavana Way area. Which it looks like that the same kind of pooling happens in Doney Park from the water that comes through the east side uh, watersheds of which again there's a total of nine that were affected by the fire eight within the county one with it that flows into the into the city Schultz Creek so this is some of the dynamics I think the most important here is that we had 45 major rainfall event major flood events this year and um it was a very active season we have a system that we established during Schultz a flood director system and we had flood directors both managing the city the two city watersheds Schultz Creek and Museum I want to thank Gary and his team for taking over that effort this year and then the district has a team that that's monitoring the eight to the north work hand in hand with the uh, weather service and monitoring the gauges gauge system uh, we added three more gauges in the um, uh, Schultz pipeline area and then we also added gauges uh, within Schultz, a gauge within Schultz Creek as well additional gauge so that's a major major effort I actually did a count on the east side of every property and it's 1729 properties are at risk for flooding on the east side and it's probably at least 500 within the city if not more so this is the results of the modeling again the two inch storm in 45 minutes 25 years year event and um the blue bars so the red bars are schultz pipeline this is what was modeled based on the the uh, burn severity map produced by the bear team the burn area emergency response team uh, and um in 2016, after we'd completed all the mitigation efforts in Schultz, uh, Jay Fuller re-ran all the modeling, did a final modeling of all the mitigation. And those blue bars are what you see there. Um, and, and or that's for Schultz Creek, obviously that had not been impacted by the Schultz fire, but that's what would what, what existed, what was known in terms of, of flood volumes you know again pre-fire pre-schultz pipeline fire or pipeline pre-pipeline fire i should say so and here it shows you that tunnel really didn't have much impact but you can see that that um pipeline had a tremendous impact all across the board particularly in in both the most southern watershed and the northernmost which is the most southern is government tank and the further north is that Upaki Lennox. Then these are the flood events, um, kind of consolidated to some extent um, because that's how they occur. There were times we had flooding both on east and west or in certain, you know, in certain flood corridors. And you can see here, uh, this data is uh, based off the, the gauges and um, that the largest event that we had was a five to 10 year event in the government tank. So we have not seen anywhere near the level of flooding we could potentially see. Response efforts, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the district produced over a million bags that were both used within the city and the county. Uh, we've placed 
Uh, this is about four miles. I think now we're at about four and a half to five miles of barrier. And we did individual mitigation exhibits for properties and um, the district covered all the cost for the um, engineers, uh, Shepherd Western, the engineers that were tasked with managing the short term mitigation effort, working with with the residents within the city, the district covered that entire cost. Um, our total response costs at this point are just about it's um, eight million dollars for this past season. We did secure a little over two million dollars from NRCS emergency for uh, exigency funding for SAM eggs and barriers, uh, but we actually spent three and a half million. So, and again, these events were we had a lot of events, but we didn't have any really major intense events. So moving forward, um, you know, people immediately began to ask, what's the plan? And we began communicating with our congressional delegation immediately. Based on what we learned from Schultz, you know, we knew we were going to need a significant amount of federal and state funding if we were going to be able to move forward with any kind of long term flood mitigation plan. And we held a meeting on August 17th um, that we co-hosted with Congressman O'Halloran and uh, had the chief deputy from the Forest Service here, as well as undersecretary um, uh, that oversees the Natural Resources Conservation Service, as well as uh, the state rep from uh, Department of Trans, well, from Federal Highways, um, Federal FHWA. And so everybody was asking, okay, what, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna mitigate this? And so we put together an initial plan. This is just, this is based on, you know, our history and knowledge of what we need to do and um, a conceptual level of, of engineering. But I think we're probably in a pretty good ballpark in terms of what this would cost. So again, the real game changer is what you do on forest. If you can't arrest that sediment on forest and, and hopefully also reduce down the volume of water to some extent, then it you can build all the channels you want. You can build all the tension you want. It won't work. It's just going to fill up with sediment. There's an, you know, just a, an ending amount of sediment up there, billions of tons. So, um, so this is the plan. I know this is difficult to see. Hope you can see a little bit better in your in your packet there. But um, basically, looking at four watersheds that that need um, that we did not prior work on. Um, we did not, government tank had a little bit of impact from the Schultz fire, but not much. Unfortunately, that whole Weatherford Canyon, all that upper area burned very severely. Um, so this includes Schultz Creek as one of those four. Uh, and um, if, you're, if you're interested, Alan Hayden with Natural Channel Design, they do all the design work for the on-force measures, the on-force watershed restoration this Monday. Uh, we will be back in this room doing the Schultz Creek flood corridor meeting, and he'll get into a lot more detail in terms of what's proposed for Schultz Creek specifically on forest. Uh, but there's a pretty significant amount of work. And then it also, the, the plan involves expanding and repairing the current five existing alluvial fan networks that are in the other flood corridors that we did mitigate during, during Schultz. So two that we didn't, Copeland and Peaceful, and then of course Schultz Creek and government that had not burned. So this is the estimated cost. You can see that Schultz Creek, and again, these are estimated costs, um, is, is gonna come in probably between three and a half to 4 million um, relative to that. Um, the largest being government tank. Fortunately for government tank, there is a tremendous amount of alluvial fan above the area there that that can be restored and will probably have a pretty major impact. Um, there is within Schultz Creek, there's a good amount of, of fan work and grade control that can be done there too. And that will be instrumental to, to all the, again, downstream projects. Um, and then within the neighborhoods, we're looking at channels. Uh, either converting existing channels. Most of the channels that were constructed during Schultz uh, were earthen channels uh, with turf reinforcement mat. They haven't performed well now with seven to 22 times or seven to 20 times the volume of water. 
Um, but so converting those to rectangular um, concrete channels and then new channels and corridors uh, where there weren't channels before. And uh, we're estimating that cost, and this is solely for East Side, is uh, 50 to 55 million. Um, we've applied for the government tank corridor application to NRCS was 26 million. Uh, we've been approved for 24 million uh, with a 25, 75% match, but that's all contingent on uh, the feds appropriating uh, money into the, that program, into the Emergency Watershed Protection Program. This is an example. This is actually the Mountain Dell channel. These channels would look very similar to this. And then the other component of the triad, you've got the on forest, get conveying the water through the neighborhoods, and then how do we cross the highway? And this is the estimated cost for crossing the highway. We're working very closely with federal highways um, to hopefully secure emergency relief funding to help with some of these projects. Uh, we did so after Schultz, we built a, um, detention facility. We purchased 80 acres and then um, built a detention facility out in the Timberline area uh, that has been hugely important to reducing down the impacts to the highway. And we're looking at, we're proposing to expand that, actually double that capacity. And the city commensurately is working with, with ADOT and federal highways relative to the 180 crossing as well. And, then the overall summary is that we're looking at probably upwards of 130 to 145 million dollars. So um, this is obviously the largest disaster that's ever faced the county or district, and the the match on this alone is probably going to be in the range of 40 million. So um, and obviously the district nor the county has those kind of revenues to devote to this. So all the projects that were proposed here are contingent on securing federal funds, primarily federal funds and hopefully state as well. Um, so Schultz Creek, and you'll see there'll be more presented here, but this is just some of the shot. If you haven't been up to see museum and what we did up there, really encourage you to get up there. Um, we could set up to have Alan take up anyone that wants to go see it. Again, performed really well this summer. Um, this is a comparison of a restored fan on, on the right and uh, an unraveled fan on the left. This is um, uh, on Forest Service property. And this is some other, this is grade control down in that left-hand corner, a large rock. That rock's all being transported in from Valley. We're paying to actually have it blasted and transported in. Um, and these are the log sills across the, the alluvial fans. Alluvial fans are just wide areas in a river. If you think about it, it's areas where the water slows down, drops out of its sediment. I probably should have explained that earlier. I assume you all know a lot more probably than maybe I should be assuming. But primarily we are using rock now, um, although in some areas we have used logs because we have to clear off the logs to grade out these fans. It, it's... it's uh, um, these are fairly high, highly engineered uh, restoration efforts and uh, have been very successful. And, and Schultz, when we completed the on-force work, we, we've had zero flooding beyond the 1,000-year flood event, rainfall event. We've had no flooding in the Schultz area, and it's largely due to these measures, similar measures over there. Fortunately, over there, we had a lot more fan than we do in museum but we're utilizing every inch of it we can in museum as well. So steps to move forward. I won't go through all of these. And you're probably well aware what it takes to put a project like this together, but key to all this again is we have to secure federal funding. Um, none of this will take place unless, and that's gonna take congressional appropriations. We either need an emergency supplemental. Um, we're hopeful that the other disasters that have been experienced across the country, Florida, Puerto Rico, Kentucky, California with the fires, that, um, that Congress will move forward with an emergency supplemental because uh, we both need funding to the Forest Service to fund the on-force measures 
as well as funding to the NRCS to fund the off forest measures. The DOT program, the Department of Transportation Emergency Relief, it's in good, it's in good shape, but they you have to have sustained a fairly significant amount of damage to ADOT infrastructure before they'll release those funds. So that's been the ongoing conversation right now is are they going to release the funds? And the initial feedback was that the 180 corridor did not get enough sustained enough damage to qualify for emergency relief ER funding. Um, they're more pushing, you know, um, that that their their infrastructure itself did not sustain damage. That's how they look at it. So that conversation's continuing. There's been a lot of background conversation going on. I'll leave it at that. That's having an influence, a positive influence in them reconsidering some of this and whether they, you know, how they're going to work with us. Uh, we may end up you having to go down the grant route with the what's called the protect grants. Um, so, but we're working it from every angle. Ed's been very involved in those conversations and we'll continue to, to push to hopefully get some of those funds um, to be able to use to address those, some of those issues. So in summary, you know, the district is approaching you know, 40 years in its existence. And, um, you know, the the whole landscape for the district now in the last 12 years and really its maturity, we've gone from that infant going into Schultz and now I'd say we're, um, we're probably young adults, maybe. I don't know, hopefully we behave better than that. But, um, you know, really, it's been really dominated. All the investment, everything's really been dominated by post wildfire. And the reality is, if we don't, though, uh, the board is really, really committed to try to hang on to those dollars for forest restoration. And that is just so critical to hang on to those, to hang on to those dollars and invest those dollars, and particularly invest those dollars through a partnership. Uh, with the city and the Forest Service and hopefully National Forest Foundation, the, the Nature Conservancy, others. I think there's opportunities to reach out to uh, businesses and others who, who are going to, who gain a lot of benefit from this work being done, um, that we really mutually all focus on this upper Rio and get that, begin to get that addressed. It won't, it will be a very costly and it will take a lot of effort, but um, it's critical to the future of the city. And within your packet is a is a brochure that we put together. This is traveling the halls of Congress. <laughs> They're on recess right now because of the election, but um, we had that back there before they went on resource res, um, on recess uh, to help explain what the disaster dynamics are here uh, with the pipeline fire. And then we also have this piece relative to um, the Upper Rio and why that's the number one priority going forward for uh, the Flood Control District. So I think that's it. So thank you for your patience and attention. I really appreciate it, but I hopefully this will put you in a position as we move forward and looking at all these dynamics post wildfire and also hopefully working together on preventing another catastrophic set of events here in Flagstaff um, that you'll be in a position to have that background and context as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you. So before we hit questions, let's listen to thank you for extremely detailed and a marathon that you <laughs> seemed to sprint through. So that was amazing because there was not one moment of that where it was like, oh, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Any questions from commission members? Millions. <laughs> Millions, yeah. Well, let's put it this way. It's 527. And <laughs> I think what we'd like to do is um, they wrap by 540 because we have a couple other items to get to just in interest of managing time. yeah and i'm here i'm not right. going anywhere right so i can come back whenever <laughs> you know so thank you i guess i'll start um i'm i'm definitely i will live in uh Coquinino state so i've seen firsthand what's going yeah. on um and i'm you know the what's happened has been a little scary but if we have a fire on the south side of the peaks 
we got real problems. You got real problems. I mean, it could take out whole neighborhoods. Yep. Um, so we can do a mitigation that's going to take time. But when I think needs to happen immediately or before the next fire season rolls around is we need to change the way the forest is used in these areas that are prone to fire and will cause flooding in urban areas like the west side of Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. Well, any uh, areas, that, I'll say rural or urban, yeah, right? Really. Rural well, or... we know that the Shoals fire was a campfire. Yes. We know the pipeline fire was due to somebody camping there and not knowing, knowing what to do with their toilet paper. Um, so it seems to me logical use stipulations like we can't have people camping in these areas, you know, from like March to the start, really into the monsoon or maybe never. They should just eliminate camping in these areas. Um, because we can't afford to have a fire at the wrong time of the year there. Um, but something we need to look at what the causes of the fires are and work with the county, the city, the Forest Service and come up with a plan that will lower the risk of fire down to the minimum we can get it to. So. Well, I, I'll say I certainly agree with you. Um, the Forest Service has banned campfires, you know, on the peaks. Uh, but they haven't banned camping and we know that uh, not everyone behaves appropriately right and knows how to manage and so i mean that's you know unfortunately the a county nor the city has any jurisdiction over those decisions right i mean we can try to influence and certainly i know the county has really tried to influence um the forest service around closing the forest and things like that uh, but I'm not saying yeah. closing the so. forest. I think you need to look at the what the causes of the fires are. I think you, you the eliminating camping would be number one. Uh, maybe eliminating uh, vehicle use of those areas. Um, I don't know if I've heard of a fire caused by a hiker or pedestrian in our area, but mm -hmm. it, I would think it'd be highly unlikely. So that's what I'm talking yeah. about: thoughtful use restriction. Well, and it's interesting because coming into this last fire season, the at the federal level, the Forest Service had actually, to some extent, modified the criteria and it actually relaxed the criteria to some extent. Um, and so, you know, it's a that's a, a big debate. I don't know if you're aware, but Neil Chapman Chapman and I both serve on the wildland, the federal wildland fire mitigation and management commission uh, that's set up to make recommendations to congress uh, relative to wildfire management and mitigation and i this is going to be a very hot topic within that group is what what is the process what are the processes and how much can uh, can local influence that process within a certain geographic area based upon what are the dynamics here locally, right? So yeah, I'm not sure about this, but I think like the north side of Bill Williams Mountain does not allow any vehicular traffic or camping in that area because it's a watershed for one and because of the risk of fire and what it could do. The, yes, and that forest supervisor enacted that several years ago um, quite a few years ago, uh, and they've always exercised uh, very tight restrictions on Bill Williams, fortunately. Yeah, you can thank Heather Provincio for that. Yeah, I think you uh, made a very good case why I shouldn't even bring up the equity issue, but that's why we're here. So I'd like to get into that if we can. First of all, wow, you got your hands full, and it sounds like you're doing a wonderful job, okay? Um, I don't know how to address the equity issue, so maybe I just kind of gently step into it somehow. So I don't think the city and the county flood control di district coordinate much on your efforts. I know that we're doing some things, and so I'm kind of like, there needs to be more coordination between us. The equity issue, I think, is there. I think you can demonstrate that you've got bigger 
fish to fry maybe right now. I don't know that for a fact. I mean, we had asked some questions about what's the percent, you know, okay, we pay half, the city residents pay about half of your budget in the tax. And then the obvious question is, well, do you spend that for the benefit of the city? And that is a question we asked you to answer. I think you've demonstrated to me that there's a whole lot going on that you don't have enough money to cover any of this. So Malcolm, why are you even bringing this up? So, but I think it needs to be addressed in some fashion. Um, but I think most importantly, where, where I would suggest that we go is for the city and the county to have some formal, okay, I don't mean uh, we meet once in a while, or I mean, not me, but staff meets once in a while with you to talk about your projects and your planning, because we have, what do we have, 3,000 3, structures in the floodplain, probably more actually in the floodplain than a lot of the rest of the county. Um, so there needs to be some kind of a formalized meeting where, or participation where we can sit down and talk about what you're doing with, quite honestly, our $5 million, knowing that you've got so much to do and you're doing a great job. So that's why it's kind of hard for me after your presentation to even bring this up, right? Because you are, you, you've got so much to do, uh, you don't have near enough money, but nevertheless, the city and the county are not even talking really um, coordinating the needs. For instance, if there was a project that was benefit to both, and maybe I'm wrong, but from what I understand, so my suggestion is somehow, is it possible to set up some kind of a formal communication between, since we do pay half of your budget, is there a way to set up a formal communication where we're at least included in the, in the discussions of budgeting and planning? So I think, you know, intellectually we can say of course there is and we'd started that conversation be before museum had hit right um but since then I, I mean we have invested far more into museum than a much much greater amount than the city has and so i think you know where we are now we, we can certainly have conversations but we have to have conversations with every jurisdiction right we, we will those conversations will need to include all the jurisdictions and depending upon where we go with funding you know if we're successful and we get a significant amount of federal funding even with a significant amount just making the match is probably going to consume the budget over the next maybe 10 to 20 years to frankly um, fairly significant amount of that so i mean i think we can play this out over time but I think the other defining piece to this is that the city's standard, and you somebody brought this up right in the beginning, the city's standard for flood control is um, frankly much greater than we would ever imagine within the county. For example, Schultz, as I mentioned, five-year post wildfire. And Ed, what are you looking at for? Ed, what are you looking at for Schultz Creek? You're trying to get to a hundred year post wildfire, right? You're trying to get to at least trying to get to 25. Yeah. And so it's a really, you know, I, I think for, for us out in the, in the rural area, frankly, whatever federal funding we get, that's the level of mitigation we're going to be able to implement. That's what we did with Schultz. Schultz, we got a certain amount of money. We went out and said, we have this amount of money. You vote with your drainage easements. The first corridors that came in with their drainage easements, you know, we worked with everybody equally. And then those that responded and dedicated their easements, we moved forward with and, and we did, we exhausted that money and more. And so, um, yeah, it, it, I think there, there's a, a, a lot of issues. And then you have these rural areas where, you know, who then looks at those special flood hazard areas, right? Who may, we, we have that direct responsibility with FEMA. We don't within the city. And I know you don't want to hear that, but we don't have that direct responsibility. We don't have that relationship within the city. That doesn't mean we can't work together in the future. Uh, but I think right now, frankly, to, to, if, if we ignore forest restoration and we focus on traditional flood control, 
we're only going to, you know, have a tremendous regret down the road. Because right now, how much are you spending a year in the Rio de Flag project, the, the Army Corps project? What, four and a half million? You've got a dedicated bond, four and a half million, I think it is each year. And kiss that goodbye if we get this fire over here. That investment is gone. Yeah. So I'll let Andy jump in too, but I think right now for us to, if we can focus on one, addressing Schultz Creek and two, forest restoration in the upper Rio, that's where we need to be investing our dollars because otherwise there will never be any money for traditional flood control ever. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Bertelson, Deputy County Manager for Coconino County, and I can't help myself. I think you all know I've worked both sides of the issue. Uh, with the city of Flagstaff and with Coconino County. And what we learned um, through all of these processes is um, Mother Nature knows no boundaries. And Malcolm, to your point, and you and I have uh, talked a lot over the years and developed a relationship, staff, our policymakers, all of us came together to try and solve a problem. Um, and, and one thing we learned about the problem, it's not solvable from a flood response perspective. Um, museum fire is a prime example. I was with the city of Flagstaff during that time, public works director. Um, thank goodness the Coconino County Flood Control District was there during that time. Not because we, the city, were completely overwhelmed, we didn't know what to do, but the county had had, the Flood Control District had had this experience with the Schultz fire and flooding. And I know people kind of get sick of hearing about Schultz, right? Uh, but we sure learned a lot from it. And uh, we applied what we learned immediately to museum. I know Lucinda's call to Joe Leverich was um, the day the fire started. And um, as we were opening up the EOC, uh, I knew that we were going to be extremely busy with this post-fire um, flood response. Uh, so uh, did that happen formally, Malcolm? Um, the, the emergency created an environment where we had to come together. So probably not as formally as it could have, but we all came together and we all worked to address um, the problem that was in front of us. And the problem that was in front of us was uh, the magnitude was beyond our comprehension. Uh, to um, Commissioner Nauman's point, with Mother Nature not having any boundaries, as we continue to work together, Flood Control District, City of Flagstaff, we have these forest health initiatives can that help on the west side? I think we learned that we had a, um, a burn that impacted the Schultz Creek watershed. We worked together to address that, just like in the museum where Lucinda and the Flood Control District had this relationship with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. As a result, and then bringing in the forest chief to our community, we were able to get funding to do some on-forest work. Was that work helpful? Um, it didn't completely truth out this last summer, but we didn't get any flooding in the museum flood area in the Spruce Avenue wash this summer either. Uh, that was a mix of rain events, and it was also a mix of the work that was done, the measures that were put in place, and we all worked together to that end. Flood Control District, that on forest work, Flood Control District brings that expertise with our consulting engineers, uh, natural channel design, Natural Resources Conservation Service as a funding agency. Now applying that to the to the tunnel fire um, on the west side of the peaks and the um, the Schultz the Schultz wash and being able the city being able to build that basin in the amount of time that they were able to build it and secure funding that quickly through the Natural Resources Conservation Service unheard of from a capital project delivery perspective. Hats off to Ed, Gary, Adam Yali, Scott Overton, Sam Beckett, everyone involved. Unbelievable effort. Uh, the modeling, Coconino County Flood Control District contributed to that modeling. So there was this partnership, formalized or not, it happened. And so as we go forward, maybe we need to better formalize that relationship, but we know that we have a very good one. And um, it's not that I enjoy these flood response efforts none of us do but working with ed gary etc it's a pleasure to work with them because we can get things done together and we've proven that we do so. i think i think that there just needs to be a better way of communicating and coordinating 
So it's not just about equity and budget, but it's about communication. So if you guys are designing projects in a vacuum and they might affect the city of Flagstaff, we have something to bring to the table, right? So for Lucinda to say essentially, no, we're gonna go on our own way and we don't need you, which is kind of what I took out of that. I mean, it kind of hurts me. Mr. Chairman, Steve Root County Manager, you know, I, I think it's important that the commission as well as the Board of Supervisors, citizens know that the tone is set at the top. The, the tone is set at the top. As the county manager, you know, Greg and I have a good relationship and I hear you. But I would say that the tone is set at the top. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let, me, let me maybe put a point on Malcolm's concerns. The budget's the budget. You can go through a budget in 10 minutes or you can go through it in 10 years. I mean, it's the money's there until it's not, right? The bigger question for me is, was in a, through your presentation, what I heard was really a broad spectrum. The things that encouraged me, are, I heard you talk about, we need a systemic approach. There's, it needs to be everything up in the on the mountains, down to the culverts, to how do we get past the highways. It's really a system. It's not just an individual thing. We could react to all these things all the time, but reacting is expensive, inefficient, and after the fact. So how do we stay ahead of this? And I think while the tone may be set at the top, well, we're the ants. And the ants can do a lot together without the top. I've worked in a lot of organizations, and what I find is when people want to get things done together, it happens. And I, I think what Malcolm's driving towards, like what I, what I heard, I think is, there's a huge opportunity for us to do four key things. Work together to effectively plan how we do the forest restoration within our area. You're gonna take it for the whole county, but but we can we can step up and help with that for the areas that, that impact Flagstaff. How do we look at every single expenditure to optimize it together? Because we're gonna do things, you're gonna do things, how are we not creating overlaps or gaps? How do we make sure that, that those expenditures are the best? Because we, we, we collectively owe that to the citizens of, of this area. I think we together need to present a unified position to state, forest service, federal, FEMA, whatever, in, in terms of this area, right? Obviously you've got, you've got more to deal with than just us, but we think we're special. But you know, we, we think, but with, within this within this geographic zone, we should be on the same page because we've been working together to to do this to build this system, right? And then the fourth one is we should both go after every darn dollar we can get in terms of grants or whatever. So I guess what I'd ask is, besides Joe, <laughs> who within flags that on the commission, city council, whatever, would be a good partner? So what types of people is it city, is it financial? you know, a financial person from our team, from a commissioner from our team, another engine, something from, you know, engineer, whatever, from, from Flagstaff that can help come together with your team and we can build the most holistic view as possible, obviously acknowledging that a lot of this rides on do we get federal money or not, and, and then we can take that up to, to, to exactly. top management and say, but basically why no? Right, right. But are you, but, but in your mind, are you getting the best support you need from Flagstaff? And, and I'm just talking different parts. Right. But, but, but looking forward down the road, you know, like the things that you talked about, we need to do in the future. Do you feel like we're getting, we're giving the right support and input to you so that we all have the best plan possible. That would be my question. Right now, I Mr. Chair and Commission, thank you for this thoughtful discussion. I, I think if there's a shortcoming here, it might be that we're not conveying to this commission what we are doing. Um, I have front row seats to everything that's been discussed this evening. Uh, I'm not actively engaged in it, but I have front row seats to it. I see a wonderful partnership, frankly, and one that has not failed us at any instant. Um, I can't 
count the number of people from the city that are engaged with both the county and the flood control district on an ongoing basis. Our most recent joint meeting occurred earlier this week. Um, there's a sharing of resources at just about every level. I can start rattling off examples. The siren system in Sunnyside and Grandview, the sandbag deployment, barricade deployments, the sharing of actual staff and vehicular equipment uh, to help mitigate. The problem is one that I think we could all understand. We, we've been in such a response mode over the past two years uh, that we have not had the, the time and convenience to neatly and succinctly message to everybody what we are doing. We have just been that busy. Uh, on the city side, to try to address that effort, we have engaged uh, a consultant to help us with the messaging, because frankly, we we didn't have the resources internally to do that. It's been very effective. Uh, newsletters, websites, neighborhood meetings, and, and so forth. Um, it's just hard to to get that message out in the way we would really like to when we find ourselves scrambling uh, to, to mitigate. How much of a scramble has it been? We all know that the pipeline fire this year extended into the monsoon season. There was no break in between. We had fires burning and and rains falling at the same time. And uh, the best we could do was to start, you know, warning our residents to, to think about flood insurance and to, to be prepared. Uh, we could not get the sandbags out quick enough, but but we did. I mean, we, we did an effective job. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll just restate what I said at the beginning. M maybe we need to do a better job bringing that communication to you as the water commission. Uh, but I do want to impress upon you I, I, from from the city manager's viewpoint, and I think you've heard from the county manager viewpoint, we're working together. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of meetings and, and we don't have an intergovernmental agreement and, and a lot of things that are in place. But when the emergencies happen and we, we mobilize our incident command uh, team, we're hand in hand. Uh, we're all at the same table and, and we're working hard. We just need to get beyond the mitigation uh, resource drain that's happening and start addressing some of these long term strategies that have been discussed. Yeah, Thank understood. you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. I, I'm not an employee of the city or the county, but we're involved in all aspects of this and there's there's significant coordination that goes on between the two um that is multiple times a week um and uh and so th from my perspective the that coordination is happening there's different priorities based on where some of the projects are but but everything has to go hand in hand. Water flows downhill. So the NRCS stuff that's happening up above the basins or the on forest work that happens up above in Spruce Avenue Wash, it comes down into the city and it directly impacts the stuff that the city is designing downstream. So they, you can't separate the two. They are inherently tied together. And the other part of it is looking at the forest restoration, you know, the forest all the, the Rio watershed all flows down through the city of Flagstaff. So yes, it impacts the, the county and the forest service, but its end user is the city of Flagstaff. So the, the work that gets done in the watershed is a direct effect, effective project that benefits the city, I guess, if you will. So uh, just a few thoughts. One more question. I agree with your four, four point thing, but I would add one more point onto that, a fifth point in that in terms of forest management use, we need to get aggressive and work together right. to do something right now. We cannot have another fire started from a campfire or somebody camping on that west side of the peaks again, if we can prevent it. And that's key, I think. Amen. Yes, hi, Chair and members of the board. It's great to be here with you this afternoon. Patrice Horseman, 
chair of the Board of Supervisors, and of course, Vice Mayor and myself with the mayor and the vice chair have been meeting all through uh, both of the fires as well as the flooding on a very regular basis. We had what we called a huddle. We met with staff, we met with the electeds. The purpose of that was coordination and communication from the top and then through the staff. So, you know, I have to say, I think we have done an excellent job, but I loved your four points, Chair, because that's the continuation. That's what we have to do as a county and the city and going forward. And by the way, that started, uh, you know, when we were meeting with um, Senator Kelly, when we're meeting with Sen uh, for Representative O'Halloran, when we read, when we met with Senator Cinema, the sit we we scheduled those meetings at the county, but the city was with us. We were partners together, and that's going to have to remain. We can't get this done alone. As a matter of fact, the city and the county together, we can't get this done. So we better look for every partnership we can with the Forest Service, with the with the Department of Agriculture. Do what we can through our representatives, and we're going to do everything to deliver for this community, for Flagstaff and Greater uh, Flagstaff and Coconino. So you've got that commitment, and we're going to work together to get it done because we do not have a choice. Yep, agree. Thank you. Okay, Kurt, I have one quick question. How do you folks work together on doing match matches together between the say you're going after a federal grant of some type? Do you coordinate going after that match money because the match is the problem? Well, we have those discussions, you know, based upon, for example, for museum, um, we we pursued both the NRCS funding and the Forest Service funding. We agreed to make the match on the NRCS funding. If there had been a match on Forest Service, we probably would have agreed to do that as well. Um, some of the smaller scale projects, um, for example, the widening of the channel um, at the top of Paradise, we mutually invested in that. Um, but again, I think when when I hear things like, well, you know, we're, there's an equity issue right now. If if I'm sitting somewhere else in this county and I look at the amount of money that the districts invested in this city in the last four years, it's tremendous. And frankly, far more than the city has. So I think, you know, it's, it's, I mean, that's, that, those are facts. And, and yes, I think as we come out of this down the road, might be five, might be 10, might be 50. I don't know how long it's going to take. We have no idea because it just depends on how quickly the funding comes. But yeah. um, I wasn't worried you know, about I think longer term, then it's a different kind of discussion. I'm right. not questioning the fairness. What I'm doing is is making sure that the city and the county are working together. Yeah, to no, make we the are. I think case. you've heard that from all the levels that I mean, we're meeting frequently and we're having these conversations. And yes, the city is, is taking responsibility for some elements. We're taking responsibility for other elements we're working together to coordinate that, you know, those efforts. So for example, we're, we're advocating and going to cover the cost. The intent is if we get the money um, for the on forest measures for Schultz Creek, for example. So, so. I just have a quick point of procedure, Marion, time-wise, do yep. they throw us out of here at six or do we? No. <laughs> okay. okay. So point one, point two, is Emily here? Okay, I was going to see if she didn't mind deferring because uh, hers is informational. Yeah, I'm, uh, this is Tamara. I'm here instead of Emily because she's ill, but we can definitely wait. Okay, because I do know we have a decision to make for our second item. So I just want to make sure that we're mindful of time. So Malcolm, one more, and then we're going to move on to the next uh, item. Yeah, just one quick thing. I want to apologize, Lucinda, to you if I sounded a little harsh buzz and that's so, neutral i'm i'm i mm. sincerely apologize thank you thank you thank you malcolm okay and we will get through this folks we will get through this oh yeah together yeah yep, and i think together. that's the exciting part of it so it's that's excellent to hear that there's that much coordination already i think we can just optimize it for how do we plan as much as possible mm -hmm. which yeah 
It's always a good wish. When you're digging the mud out, though, you don't have time to plant. All right, so next slide. And Lisa, thank you so thank much you for everybody much. from the county and, and the whole team. We greatly appreciate your time and the obvious level, level of effort in that presentation. So thank you so much. Great, thank really you. appreciate it. Why don't we move now to item 4B, which is the sewer reimbursement agreement with Coconino County. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and Mr. Gary Miller, thank you. Gary, you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commission. Uh, Gary Miller, Water Services Engineering Section Director. I'm here to present a discussion or at look for direction from the Commission on uh, some changes to our codes as it pertains to uh, time frames for reimbursement agreements. So you might be asking yourself, what is a reimbursement agreement? Um, a reimbursement agreement is an agreement that uh, can be afforded to any agency or developer when the improvements that they need to construct are above and beyond what would typically be required. And so what it does is it allows them to uh, construct those improvements so that the project can move forward um, and then get reimbursed for those co construction costs of those uh, improvements um, to, to help alleviate some of that uh, financial burden. It's not afforded to everyone who has to construct improvements because some of those improvements are required. Uh, this is just for those improvements that are required above and beyond what would typically be required. So a little bit of the history um, on uh, the the city and the Fort Tut Hill Park. Um, the city has one of its highest producing wells in Fort, Fort Tut Hill. Uh, actually, I think it is our highest producing well. Um, and over the last several years, we've approached the county and entered into several agreements for an additional well out there, which has been drilled. We're looking to develop that well and uh, put it online here in the next year or two. Um, and um, as part of that, the, the county recognized that it, there would be benefit to them to have sewer out at Fort Tut Hill. So the county moved forward with uh, construction of a sewer main that tied, and this is where I need to pull up my map. So if you'll give me one second. So this is a a map that we created for the agreement that's currently in draft. Um, and this is the benefiting area map, and I'll get into what the benefiting area represents. But um, on the south end of this, you have Fort Tut Hill. At the northeast end of this, you have University Heights. And so the sewer main that was constructed actually stays within the low point of the, the geography of the area, uh, goes through the wash and ties into a sewer main up in uh, the University Heights area. So the, the portion of the sewer line that qualifies for a reimbursement agreement is the portion of construction from University Heights to the boundary of Fort Tut Hill. And um, when we do a reimbursement agreement, we look at the benefiting area. So who can tie into this sewer line in the future? And that's what this map represents. And it's really just based on geography and how sewer would flow in this area and who could potentially benefit or utilize that sewer. So why was the code established with a 10 year time frame? I don't know that I have a good answer for that. This was established years ago and um, my my only assumption is based on looking at the benefits and um, the the disadvantages of different time frames. So um, the city offers this service to developers uh, with a fee, and there is a, I'll say, a, a responsibility that the city has in administering a reimbursement agreement. So there is a, a cost that is paid to the city, um, and the longer that agreement goes on, the more burden there is on the city, the more cost there can be. Um, and so um, in the Valley, I know that reimbursement agreements are taken advantage of a lot, um, a lot more than they are in the city of Flagstaff. Um, and I think the reason for that is uh, development happens a lot faster down in the valley. Things expand quicker, more development comes online that developers can take advantage of these reimbursement agreements. Flagstaff development occurs a lot slower. It just moves slower. Um, and that 10 year time frame. 
um, you might not recognize the full benefits of a reimbursement agreement because development takes so long to occur. Um, in the 15 years I've been with the city, I can't think of one reimbursement agreement that's been done. I, we were trying to brainstorm earlier and there may have been one, but they're real, they're very rare um, and hardly taken advantage of in the city of Flagstaff. So um, we have looked at other agencies in the Valley um, that also do reimbursement agreements. It's very common. Um, and the a couple of the cities I looked at, I looked at City of Scottsdale and I looked at City of Surprise. Both have um, codes that allow for longer time frames, and the time frames in those cities are uh, 20 years. There were some limitations uh, with the City of Surprise, but the the moral of the story is yes, they do allow longer time frames. This is something that isn't regulated directly in statute, um, and it's typically regulated by individual city codes. So uh, the question I have for the commission is, do, would you support a uh, change to code to allow for those long, longer time frames, um, or would you like to keep code the same? And this issue is bring, being brought forward as a direct result of the county reimbursement agreement that we're working on right now. So with that, I'll answer any questions and open it up for so, discussion. So Gary, uh, one, one clarification, or two, two quick questions. The reimbursement goes from who to the, is it, is it oh. individual people, the developers, who's, 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 let's help me understand the flow of money, one, two. My first thought was, well, if it's 10 years and we ask for 20, doesn't it just renew for another 10 years? But what you answered that, the answer is no, you'll set it for 10 or 20 years. That's I'm correct. trying to understand the, the money flow here. Yeah, I apologize, That's I should okay. have made that clear. So the county is the one that paid for the construction of the sewer main. So they have put that cost out there. Um, the, the way the reimbursement agreement works is you put, it's not a lien against the property, but you basically tell each individual property owner within the benefiting area that if you tie into the sewer, you pay for tying into that sewer. The way the money flows is that money comes to the city through our finance department, and then we pay that to the county when we receive those reimbursements. Is it like a connection fee and then a monthly, or is it all monthly tied into your monthly rate? Yeah, Mr. Chair, can I jump in? So Brad Please. Hill, Interim Butte, uh, Water Services Director. So one part that Gary, I want to, before we get to your question, one part that Gary didn't mention was the reason why they come forward with a reimbursement agreement is we have, we make them when they put in that line, let's say they needed a six inch line and we said, nope, you put in a 12. It's the different, the cost differential between the six and the 12 that the county wants to recoup. They still paid for their six, no matter what. So that's an important distinction. And then those beneficiaries are the ones that Gary has on that map. So that's the part. And then when, the, when you say six and 12, you're talking about the diameter? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. So, so the and the cost is like triple for 12? That the city requires. The county paid for what they need to put in, but it doesn't make sense long term for them to only put in the size of a sewer that benefits all of that area. So the city said, no, nope, oversize it. And the county said, fine, but we want to have the ability to recoup those dollars from that, from the landowners on that map which the primary developer at this time would be the hospital. The hospital clearly owns a lot of that. We land. used to call these recapture agreements. You changed yes. the name on us. Yeah. I think they've always been and called reimbursement agreements, but they're, ha <laughs> yeah, unofficially. And, and is there, just to understand, is there, we know when the project's done, how much the Delta is, the difference. And then, so Mr. Chair, at the beginning, we bid that and we know what that delta is right. before and, the project starts. And so does the reimbursement slash recapture stop once you hit that, that, or does it keep going? In other words, let's say it's a million dollars. If we re reimburse a million dollars, then we stop or do we keep going and the county keeps getting more money? So the way those work is each property is uh, allocated their proportional share based on uh, the square footage or the, the land area that benefits that sewer or that could benefit from that sewer. And so the, 
in in reality, um, the city or the county likely will not get reimbursed that full delta because not all of these properties are going to develop. Right, right. So you take the money and spread it. You then there's it. a reimbursement, but it's not. OK, I got it. Thank but you. If you don't extend it to 20 years, then a lot of properties get a free sewer, which is not necessarily good either. Yeah, that makes sense. Are, are these areas currently on septic then? Yeah, these areas are either undeveloped and if they are developed, they're single family homes and on septic. I would support this. Uh, any development in that area should be on on city sewer just to protect the aquifer. Yeah. OK, so let's and I want to clarify ahead. one thing. I apologize for okay. the interruption. Um, we had looked at trying to adopt this as a I'll say exception to the code through just the contract we were entering in with the county. Um, the current direction from the city attorney's office is that we have to make a, a code change to city code. So this would um, actually extend to any future recapture agreements, not just this one, just to clarify. Okay. Yeah. Mary, is there an official motion that we need to put forth or is it, can we just simply have a vote about the, the commission itself approves the concept that, that Gary's put forth? If someone can make a motion to approve, and then we'll go from there. Sec a motion, second, and then okay. we'll go through. So can I get you're, you're correct, Mary, and this is Sterling uh, Commission. Uh, we would need a motion, a second, and then a vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Can I get one of the commissioners to give me a very uh, simplified motion? I'll give it a go. Um, I make the, the motion that we approve. The reimbursement, the the availability of a reimbursement agreement to the county of Coconino for 20 years. Extend it to a 20 year recapture as opposed to 10, right? For a 20 year recapture. Yeah. Any second? I'll second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Excellent. All right, with that, and then we will have 4C will be deferred until next meeting. And thank you, Emily, and the team for putting, all I know Emily's not feeling well, but thank you to the team for putting the information together. We, we definitely do want to hear about that uh, item because we have some, I'm sure we have some questions and comments about <laughs> further water conservation efforts. But item five will bit business seeing none. Uh, item six, any informational items to from the chair, commission, or staff? Mr. Chair, just a quick one. You, uh, the We're going to be bringing back, probably at the uh, November meeting, a dashboard. It has been brought to our attention. Is there a way that we can have a, a dashboard to effectively communicate projects, policy items that are on your list to come and or that they have been and you've given us direction our goal the chair actually reached out to me uh, a month ago or so and staff's currently working on it so we'll have that back uh in november thank you so much that'll be great Welcome. Uh, just now that you know that item of the flood control district may, makes me think of are we going to see ed back with anything for the um uh, rate increase or the bond probably not the bond but you know, I'm thinking now that we've had that presentation and and uh, not a lot has is going to happen there that, you know, I would be supportive of the increase if that's where we go. Because remember, recall that one of the reasons we wanted the county here to talk about the equity issue was related to the, incre the bond and the increase. So I don't know what the relationship there is. Is there anything? Are we going to see him again or? So, Chair, um, uh, no. So what's happening is uh, next Tuesday is a work session for city council. So staff will be presenting the, the very, uh, very similar, if not the identical presentation you all saw last month. And then there'll be the public hearing on November 15th, two weeks after that. But then we weren't planning on coming right. back to the commission. But two council meetings, if you're interested. One next Tuesday and one to two a couple weeks after. Excellent. 
Thank you, Beth. Okay. Any other items? No. All right. Then we'll move to item seven, adjournment. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for your time. And again, uh, so we we. Sh I'll draft a note back to the county folks as a, a thank you. That was a lot of effort on their path to to put put that together. So, yes, yes, it actually was.